Today I'm, I'm coming to the end of a series that we have uh, been in this month, and it, it's this, what, what does the Bible really teach? And we've talked about some different things, and, uh, and, and researched our Bibles in some ways, and it brings us this morning to, uh, to I, I think, a very important one. Maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's the big one. And this is a, a topic that, to be honest with you, I, I could sit here and, and I could talk for several hours uh, about, uh, about this particular topic and, and talk to you about some things. But I, I, I'm guessing that you probably didn't sign up for that. And uh, so we won't, uh, we won't approach it that way. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be as direct and I'm going to be as succinct as, as I can possibly be on, on this particular topic. And... Um, I, I'm doing what I'm doing here this morning a little bit differently, intentionally. I didn't just wear this shirt because I wanted to sell it to, to a bunch of you. Um, I, and it's partially to uh, help support our, our young people, but more just to kind of um, feel like we're a little bit relaxed and, and we're talking through some things together. I brought this table in here uh, because I don't want to be standing up and, and it's like I'm trying to cram something down your throat. Um, but more like I'm, I'm just trying to share with you um, some things that, that I think are very, very important, not only to me, but I believe to, to all of us. And I'm going to need some help from, from you today, um, because my intent this morning is, is not to start a debate. Uh, it, it really isn't. And I'm, aware, I'm, I'm well aware that there are a lot of different ways that people address this particular topic uh, of salvation. And I am not here to, I'm not here to criticize anybody. Uh, I'm not here to demean anybody. I am simply here to share with you, as, as I understand it, this is what the Bible really teaches. So what I'm asking, as far as help is, is if I could get this out of you, is to put aside some of the preconceptions that you may have when it, when it comes to this subject. And let's take a look together um, to see what God's Word really has to say to us. Uh, let's pray as, as we start. God, I, I am I'm thankful that you give me this opportunity, and Father, I ask that you would forgive my sins, that you would use me in, in spite of, of my humanity, maybe that you would use my humanity to, to speak directly to my friends. And Father, help us today to, to look into your Word and to see that it really does uh, make some sense to, to us. And help us to, to know that, that all we need to do is, is apply the things that you have taught us. And help us to be about that business today in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to know that the whole process of, of the topic of salvation, what does the Bible really say about salvation? I believe, quite, quite honestly, I believe it starts here in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, and, and we talked about verses 10 and 11 a little bit earlier about good works and what God has designed our lives to do. We talked about that last week. But the first part of that, the prior two verses say this, for it's by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, let me just make one clarifying statement here at this particular point, because this has been a point of contention, I think, in some places, is what is in that second line there, as you see towards the end, and this, and not from yourselves, what is the this? And linguistically, and I'm not going to go into a long thing, but, but it's, the Greek language has all kinds of rules, and the rules that are at play here mean that it's the, the process, the process of salvation, it's, it's, not, it's not just grace, it's not just faith, it's the entire process there. So that's kind of the beginning point, and I want you to know that I believe every piece uh, of, of the scripture. I, I believe in the complete truth that we are saved by grace through faith, that there is not one thing that I can do to earn my salvation. But I also want you to understand that, that there is a truth at play and that is that the truth of Scripture is never less than one single verse, but it is always more. That's why God gave us the entire New Testament. And that's why my job as a pastor is to teach you the full counsel of what God says. And so if we just stopped here at this particular point, it would allow itself to, 
um, I, I think to, to lead to a little bit of confusion in some ways. So what does this really mean? How does this play out? And I gotta, my job is, is to share with you the full counsel. It's also to encourage you some things. And, and I hope that you have your Bibles with you. And if you do have your Bibles with you this morning, or a Bible app, and if you have your phone with you and you do not have a Bible app on it, shame on you. Turn to the six-year-old next to you and say, could you please put a Bible app on my phone? And they'd be glad to do that. I, I happen to use the U version uh, on mine because uh, it's not the only one out there. There are other good ones, but it happens to be the one that I use um, because I, I, think that it's a, I think it's a very good place to start. But... Again, it's, it's, it's not the only place that we have. And so as, as, we, as we take a look through these things this morning, I just hope that, uh, I just hope that you can see that there are, are all kinds of things um, that God has to say for us and that he wants from us in this whole process. And uh, so I want to share, I'm going to share several thoughts with you this morning. And we're going to be in that book of Acts. And so hold the book of Acts open in your lap and we're going to, we're going to talk through that now. Now, with that said, I'm going to back up just a little bit. I, I don't want you to, because I'm going to flash the scriptures up here. I, I don't want you to, to necessarily turn here. You can if you want to. But I'm going to rewind to Christ's last instructions. This is what Jesus said to us just before he went back into heaven. And he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you, even to the close of the age. Now, that is how Matthew records that. Mark's a little bit, Mark's a little bit quicker on the draw in almost everything that we find in Scripture, and Mark records that same event just a little bit differently. It's not, it's not, it's not in, a, in a different way, not different facts. Here's just what Mark says. Mark says, he, that's Jesus, obviously, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Who believes in his, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So, how does the Bible teach us about this process of, of conversion, or how does it teach us about the topic of salvation? Now, Again, there are some things that we need to get a hold of is that, first of all, you need to understand that you need to be saved. And, and I'm going to get you there very, very quickly because the Bible says this truth that we all know from experience, and it's all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, it's like I talked to you last week. It doesn't matter, doesn't really matter if that all came down from Adam or if it's just something that we have perfected in the long haul. All of us are participants in sin. And we all fall short of God's glorious ideal. Now, I don't know, coincidentally, maybe not coincidentally, you just, flip a, you just flip a couple more chapters in the book of Romans, and it says, for the wage of sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we're outside of Christ, if we're in sin, the wage is death. But there's a gift that comes about because of that, and it's a good gift. This passage talks about the consequence Good consequences and bad consequences, and both of them are reality. You go just a couple, a couple more chapters in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And you notice that this is the very first time that this word confess pops up in the scripture doesn't mean that it wasn't present in, in the other passages. This means this is the first time that it pops up here. Um, and so as we walk through this whole thing, we'll see some of these things take place. Now, some people have taken this, this call for confession. Some people have taken this, and it has become what we know of today as the salvation prayer, or some people call it the sinner's prayer. And I, I, I want you to know this. The sinner's prayer, and also the, the phrase that uh, seems to be cor uh, correlate with the whole thing, asking Jesus into our heart, or praying Jesus into our heart, those are never found in Scripture. Never. As a matter of fact, they were foreign to Christianity until about the 17th century. Now, I also know that it was in the year 
Um, it was in the year 2012 in the Southern Baptist uh, Convention after one of their uh, highly noted preachers, David Platt, spoke about the qu questioning of the whole sinner's prayer idea. Is that the whole convention got together and, and they brought down this edict that said uh, that they believe that the sinner's prayer is a scriptural uh, way of talking about confession, confession and belief. And I'm saying, well, I gotta take, I gotta take issue with that. I, I don't find that in scripture. And as, as a Christian, and, and certainly as a Christian leader, my responsibility is to say, what is the Bible? What does the Bible really teach? The whole idea of asking Jesus into our heart, we know where that came. That came from the 17th century Puritans. That was the first time that we see that crop up. And that was a way of, of being able to relate the gospel to younger children. But understand that those are, those are new things. So on topic, what does the Bible really say about this whole thing? Now we're going to the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is a very logical place to go because it is a companion book to the Gospel of Luke. Luke writes both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And he, he says, in, he, he talks about his Gospel, and, in, and then he says, here's my second work. And now the book of Acts shows us what happens as the church unfolds in the first century. And so it gives us a detailed instruction of how the church comes into, the, into, into being. And by the way, we seek to be a New Testament Christian church. And what that means is we seek, we seek to follow the New Testament pattern of the church as far as possible. <coughs> so that means where the Bible is, is teaching us, we want to follow what the Bible has to say. Now, if the Bible doesn't say anything about something, certainly there's freedom to talk about those things, but where the Bible talks, uh, we want to talk at that particular point. So what we're going to do this morning, the rest of the morning, is we're going to deal with the ex specific examples of conversion in the book of Acts and see what it has to say there about how people come to Christ. And so let's do with that. Acts chapter 2. <coughs> now, Acts chapter 2 is, is a wonderful place to be because that is the beginning of the New Testament church. Just a, a beautiful, we know that that is the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost was a Jewish festival. It had nothing to do with the Christian Christianity. <coughs> it had to do with Jews gathering together. They're all gathered in Jerusalem, not long, 50 days. 50 days after the Passover, and we know that Christ was killed right after the Passover. Okay, so here they are, and people in that time, they stayed in the same place. So conservative estimates say that there were probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 million people still in Jerusalem at, the, at that particular time. And the, the apostle Peter and the rest of the apostles are gathered in a room, and the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit comes on them in a spectacular way, and there are tongues of fire on them, and then they go out into the streets, and it tells us that the people could hear the preaching in their own language, because tongues has always been a language. And so now they're speaking in, in languages that people can hear. And some people say, ah, you know what, those guys are just a bunch of drunks. And Peter says, wait a second, we're not drunk. It's too early in the morning. We're not going to do that. And then he gets up and he preaches a sermon. And his sermon is the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus. And then he concludes towards, towards the very end of that sermon. He says, now I want you to know something. This Jesus that you killed, and he doesn't say this, but you know that this is happening. This Jesus that you killed, and they can't find the body. Let me tell you about that body that has been raised. And he says, this Jesus is Lord and God. So let's pick up with Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Because here's what's happening. It says, when the people they heard this, they were cut to their heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Now see, obviously they had believed the preaching of, Jesus, uh, of Peter and the other apostles. Then say that they believed it. But it would be ludicrous not to accept the fact that they believed it. And now here's Peter's response to them. And Peter replied, repent. Now there's another word that we haven't seen in the whole process before. Repent. Repent simply means change your heart. Simply means turn around. You go in one direction, turn around, and go the other direction. It's a decision that a person makes. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. 
Now, he goes on to say this, and I think he, he says this because he probably saw what was happening and that we'd still be talking about this in, in um, 2018. He says, I want you to know this promise, isn't just for you guys here, this promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That's us. That's us. So Peter answers their question. What do we need to do to get out of this mess? And Peter says, very simple, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, understand that those of you who have probably gone through this more, and maybe some of you will me, I am not advocating water regeneration. I am not saying that there's something mystical about the waters of the baptistry that saves you. I'm not saying that. There is only one thing that saves you, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. But what I am saying is let's see a pattern that emerges here. Because if you were to go down a couple of verses in the same chapter, you would see the incredible impact that it has on it. It says that somewhere around 3,000 people accepted his message and were baptized that day. Then say that 3,000 people signed up for a four-week training class and it said, this is how you join the church. It said 3,000 people responded to that message and they were baptized and they were baptized that day. All right, let's go just a little bit to the book, on in the book of Acts, to the 8th chapter of the book of Acts. And in the 8th chapter, there is this, there's a group of people who are called the Samaritans, because now we've got to get the gospel to the Samaritans. The Samaritans, in case you aren't really sure of that, Samaritans were kind of half-breeds. They were kind of a cross between a Jew and a Gentile, and nobody liked them. And so now the gospel is coming in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 8, the gospel is coming to those people for the very first time. And there is one guy who's kind of a ringleader in this whole thing, and his name is Simon, and he is a sorcerer. Those are real things. Now in Acts chapter 8, it, it, it talks to us about the process of, of them sharing the gospel. Now pick up in Acts chapter 8, verse 11. And it says, they, this is all the people there, the Samaritans, they followed Simon because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere. Simon, the sorcerer, he believes and he is baptized, and he follows Philip, astonished by the great signs and the miracles that you see. You see what happened? They believed the message. They believed the message, and they were baptized. Now, you don't have to go far for the next one. It's in the eighth chapter of, of the book of Acts, too. You just go a little farther down where we start talking about a guy by the name of Philip. And uh, they talk about Philip and he is, um, his conversation that takes place with this Ethiopian official. i, I got to be honest with you, I feel really badly for this guy because they identify this guy as the Ethiopian eunuch. And I'm always thinking, why do you got to bring that into it? Well, there's a real reason for that. It's because that's how you got to be an official. If you weren't born into it in that day, uh, you had to show, uh, you, you, you had to make yourself a eunuch so that you would be uh, acceptable to the king. And the reason was, is if you're a eunuch now, you're no longer a threat to the king. Your line's not going to come up and overthrow his line. And that's why they do that. But I'm still not exactly sure why uh, they decide to identify him that way, but they do. But it says that Philip is now brought up to this chariot, this this. Ethiopian guy, he's just riding along in his chariot, and he's reading from the Old Testament. He's reading from the book of Isaiah. And he's looking at this, and he's in a, in a specific passage of Isaiah where it talks about the Messiah. <coughs> and all of a sudden, there's Philip. It doesn't tell us how Philip stopped the chariot. I don't know if he put his thumb out or if he just kind of poof, he's, he's there in the chariot. I don't know, but somewhere there he is in the chariot with this Ethiopian official. And he asks the, the guy the question, he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian says, how in the world can I understand it unless somebody tells me? 
So the Bible tells us that Philip began to talk to him about it. And in verse 35, it says, it says, then Philip began with that very passage of scripture there in Isaiah and told him the good news. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture. He told him the good news about Jesus. Now the next verse says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, well, look, here's some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, I don't know exactly how, but somehow in that telling of the good news of Jesus Christ, the issue of baptism clearly came up. Because now they come to the water and the Ethiopian says, look, what keeps me from being baptized? Now in the green it says they went down into the water because I want you to understand a couple of things. It said this is a picture of baptism. Baptism, in its, in, as, we have, as, as the word has been brought down to us, has always, should have always been defined as to dip, to plunge, or to immerse. Those are the only three possible definitions for the word baptize. There are other words for sprinkle and pour. One is the word keo and one is the word rentizo, and those words are not used here. The word baptizo is used here. And it's an interesting little word, isn't it? Because most Greek words we translate and give them a definition, but here we don't even translate this word, we transliterate it. Baptizo becomes baptize. And it, it, it was always, for centuries, it, it, it was always a process of dipping and immersing someone in water. Now, I know that that has changed in society. I also know that that didn't change for the first 13 centuries of Christianity. It became an issue of convenience in the Roman Catholic Church late in the 13th century. We understand it. We know that 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 that's a fact. Now the last part of that says when they came up out, up out of the water again, the Lord took Philip away and the eunuch didn't see him again, but he went his way rejoicing. It's an incredible, it's an incredible picture. Let me take you, let me take you just real quickly to um, the book of Romans. Because if you were to look in the book of Romans, Romans talks about our baptiz- baptism as a death a burial, and a resurrection. That's why immersion so beautifully fits the picture. As a person is buried in the waters and is raised out of the waters. Again, Romans 6 talks about that kind of thing. And so it's just part of the process. And we're seeing, we're seeing a pattern emerging. Now, now um, as, we go th- as we go through here, I think it's, it's easy for us to see a whole lot of things going on. Acts chapter 10, now, if you want to go there, now this is, this is another great one, because this is not the first Gentiles, not the first Jews, uh, or not the first the Samaritans, first Jews, this is the first Gentiles. This is a household of Cornelius, where the first Gentiles are coming to Christ, now they've got to deal with them. And it's no wonder that the picture here in Acts 10 looks a lot like Acts 2. Because Acts 2 is when the whole thing begins to unfold for the Jewish people. And now in Acts 10, it's unfolding for the Gentile nation. And Acts 10, we see see the Holy Spirit, an, an incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit on those Gentiles believers. Peter, Jew of Jews, had been told, you need to go and you need to talk to these Gentiles and help bring them into the fold. And it takes some convincing for him to do that, but finally he does that. And he meets the household of Cornelius. And there's an incredible display that goes on. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And then we find in Acts chapter 10, verse 47, Peter comes to this conclusion. Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They receive the Holy Spirit just as we have. Also understand this, is that there is a rule in the Greek language that says that when you use the word baptizo, the instrument is water unless it's otherwise specified. So now he's talking about what's happening here. Those who, those who will contend that there's this baptism and there's that baptism, the baptism of water, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, doesn't appear in Scripture. Linguistically, it, it, it just doesn't fit. Okay. So, 
Here's what's happening in this process is, is, is that the, the, now the first Gentile converts are being baptized as followers of Christ. Next one is Acts chapter 16. It's a lady by the name of Lydia. Lydia is, is, is a wonderful person. She's, she, wants, she wants to follow. She wants to take all of this in. She wants to be a part of the whole thing. And I've got to be honest with you, um, the whole process with Lydia, that's what I'm praying for. That's what I'm praying for you. It says in Acts 16, 14, it says, one of those listening, this is the Apostle Paul working there, he was, listen, was listening to a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. That means that she was wealthy. Okay, she was from the city of Thyatira, and she was a worshiper of God. And the Lord, op- I love that phrase, the Lord opened her, respond, her heart to respond to, the, to God's message. And when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. She persuaded us. You know, I'm, I'm going to take another real quick aside at this particular point because there, there are questions that come up with the, the whole issue of baptism sometimes. And, and uh, I'm going to answer two of them. It's, it's one, who can be baptized? And the answer is anyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ, who genuinely puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that means that a person has to understand their sin. They have to understand their sin. They have to understand the enormity of the cost that it cost Jesus Christ his life. His life. They have to understand that their, their involvement in that sin as well. But that's it. Those who choose to come, those who choose to come and want to follow, they can be baptized. Second question that comes up sometimes is that uh, who can do the baptizing? Well, to the answer of that is, is real simple, is you have to be a member of the clergy. And we're not sure if youth ministers count or not. No. The truth is, the Bible doesn't say. And I told you earlier, where the Bible speaks, we speak where the Bible is silent. We are silent. So, you roll yourself back to the book of Acts, and how many people were being baptized at that time? 3,000 people. You don't think everybody was in on the act? So, it's, 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 not, it's not crystal clear on that whole thing, but I'll be honest with you. I, what I'm waiting for, and you may be a little surprised to hear this come out of my mouth, but what I'm waiting for is the day that a good believing woman takes someone into the baptistry with, with them that they have had a spiritual impact on and baptizes that person. Now, I know that that would be something that wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed in most churches. But the Bible didn't say. And if, some, and, and if somebody has that spiritual connection, that's who they should be baptized by. I think this is important. Son. The Bible doesn't speak, so, so we allow those things uh, to take place. And, and I, I honestly, I, I, I can't. I can't wait to see that. So, let's go on. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas on their missionary journey, have been put in jail for telling the message of Jesus. And in the middle of the night, they decide to have a worship service. And so in the middle of the night, they're singing. They're singing hymns to God, and they are worshiping God, and God responds with this huge earthquake. And this earthquake takes place, and the cell doors, boom, are open. And the chains on the prisoner's legs are open. <coughs> A great act of God, right? Everybody's getting out of jail. That's not how it works. Because the, the, the jailer there, the, the Philippian jailer, he knows what's going on, and he sees the doors open. And he hears the chains go clink. And he knows he is responsible And if any of those prisoners escape, it's his life. And he doesn't want to be tortured. So what he does is he yanks his sword out, and he is getting ready to kill himself. 
He's getting ready to kill himself. But Paul says, wait a second, we're all here. We're all here. And they get a chance to share the gospel of Jesus. It says, the jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And then as a result of their being there, them being there and sharing the good news, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then he spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour, now we're probably two o'clock in the morning. Two o'clock in the morning. They, they have in church. It says, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and his family, his family were baptized. Now, I hope that you're catching a pattern. Believe and be baptized. Believe and be baptized. Every time, believe and be baptized. Again, I am not saying that baptism is what saved you. But I am saying this, is that it is irresponsible and impossible to read through the New Testament and say the baptism is unimportant. You can't do it. Time after time, every time, there it is, believe and baptism. Again, it's the blood of Jesus that saves us, but the response, at least the biblical response, is always the same. Now again, I'm not saying that you just add water. I, I heard this, uh, this uh, comedic, uh, comedic routine, uh, routine by this uh, guy from, uh, guy from uh, um, Russia. And uh, he says, I came to America and I went down, I went down the aisles of the store and I, I get, go down his first aisle. And I, I see here's, here's some powdered milk. All you do is you add water and you have milk. And then I went down a, another aisle and there was some powdered orange juice. And all you do is you add water and you got orange juice. So I went down a third aisle and I saw this baby powder. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what a country! <laughs> and you don't just add water. That's not where it starts. That's not where it starts. But there is a pattern here. Now, I know that maybe there are some of you saying, well, are you saying then, do I got to be baptized? I mean, do I have to be baptized? Let me tell you something. If, you have, if that's going on in your brain, I want to say one thing to you. Don't. I've met with couples where you could clearly tell that the hopeful bride-to-be was dragging the guy in with her. And he's saying, do we really got to be married? Do we really have to do this? I said, no, you can leave. But you see, being baptized is a privilege. It's a privileged response to the gospel message. And if you're asking it in, in a way, does this something that I got to do? You know, as lovingly as I can possibly say this is, please don't. Come back when it's something that you desire to do, when you desire to give your life to Jesus Christ. Because it's all part, it's all part of the same process. I got one more example real quickly, and I skipped over this intentionally. And this example happens twice. It's in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts and the 22nd chapter of the book of Acts. And it's the conversion of the guy that we know of as the Apostle Paul. They knew of, they knew of him as Saul of Tarsus, the killer of Christians. And on the road to Damascus to gather and kill Christians, one day he is blinded by a light. And now he's face to face with the truth. He's face to face with Jesus. Now I'm going, to take this, I'm going to take this out of Acts 22. So if you're flipping around, go to Acts chapter 22. Because this is Paul's account of what took place. And in Acts chapter 22, verse 12, this is what takes place. A man named Ananias came to see me. 
He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by the Jews living there. He stood behind, beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. Now get this. You'll be a witness to all the men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. What are you waiting for? Really? I don't have that baptistry filled and warm in two hours. It's a very simple thing. Maybe you're thinking, well, I don't know enough to do that. It's not about what you know. It's about who you choose to follow, who you choose to surrender your life to. All you have to do is you have to know that you have sinned and that Jesus died for your sins. That Jesus took those lashes, not 40 lashes, because the Romans didn't have that rule. He took those lashes on his back. He bore all of that. He took that cross and he walked what we know of as a Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows. He took those nails and he gave his life for you and he is asking you, won't you follow me? It's not a duty. This is not something that you check off of your to-do list. It really isn't. It's given your life in surrender to Jesus Christ. What are you waiting for? Father, I pray this morning that you would help us to follow you. That we would honestly choose to surrender our lives to you and follow you. You have done so much for us. You have walked so far and you have done so many things. When you ask, you ask us just to give ourselves to you. Father, if there are people in this room who need to give themselves to you, Father, I pray that you would bring them to me or somebody else who they trust. And let's don't wait anymore. Let's don't wait anymore, Father. Help us. Help us to be about your business in this world and to give you the glory in the name of Jesus.